Okay, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. As I think that was Edward R. Murrow, a radio announcer of 80 years ago, used to say. We were talking about this guy uh, named Alfred Fagener, who had this incredible brain that simply refused to fit into any single academic discipline. That was brilliant all over the place very interdisciplinary, as we say now. And he's the one who pointed out that there were a number of fossils and a number of living organisms that were distributed in ways that suggested the continents had once been joined. Specifically that um, between roughly 290 and 200 million years ago, all of the continents on Earth were part of one giant landmass, one supercontinent that he named Pangea, all Earth. And beginning roughly 200 million years ago, Pangea began to break up. And it was a long and complicated breakup. And, you know, North America and Europe are still friends, but they both kind of decided they should see other people. That was a joke. Break up. Uh -huh. Get it? Uh, okay. The, the humor is really firing on all cylinders. Um, and anyhow, the uh, first big split was basically in an east west direction with North America. Europe and most of Asia going off as one large continent that's now called Laurasia, and South America, Australia, uh, Antarctica, New Zealand, Africa, and India. Hello, morning. Had been part of a, the southern half of Pangaea. Uh, forming a big mass now called Gondwana. And then both of those further fragmented to give rise to the continents that we know today. And I showed you some of his fossil evidence for this. I showed you some of the living organisms that are still around that are found only on the continents that used to be Laurasia or only on the continents that used to be Gondwana suggesting to Wegener that they had evolved when Laurasia and Gagwa were united continents. And then even after the breakup, uh, these groups continued to grow on the separate continents. So Southern Beach, for example, uh, trees in the genus Nothophagus, uh, are now found in Southern South America. Looks like it's mostly in Chile, in New Guinea, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. There's fossil evidence that they used to grow in Antarctica. Now you might say, okay, maybe the seeds of Southern Beach just floated because that can happen. Um, plant seeds, many of them float. Uh, I know of cases where seeds of tropical Caribbean trees have ended up in places like washed up on the beaches of Norway. So it is possible if the currents are right for seeds to travel a long distance. Um, things like coconuts can float for thousands of miles and then germinate if they ever manage to wash up on, a, uh, on, a, on an appropriate beach. That's how coconut palms get around. But you can't use that explanation to explain why lungfish have the same distribution. Australian, African on the left, Australia at the top right, South American on the bottom, Gesundheit. And you might say, well, okay, lungfish can swim. Technically, yes, but lungfish are not powerful swimmers. You know, they're not built to cross oceans. They're not tuna, uh, which are. And they're all freshwater beings. They're not going to be swimming 3,000 miles across a saltwater ocean, just not the kind of thing they can do. 
And you can add to our list uh, conifers in the family Arcariaceae, which includes the one you might know would be this thing called the Norfolk Island Pine, uh, which you can get in many garden stores, um, even uh, Bourgeois Kroger over on Salem Road. Uh, we'll have them out around Christmas time because they make nice potted plants and uh, they look kind of like Christmas trees. If you want a, a live potted Christmas tree in your home, you know, you can get Norfolk Island pines, uh, but they're not native to here. Uh, they're native to the Norfolk Island uh, off the coast of Australia. Um, a group of mud minnows called the Galaxians a whole family of earthworms, uh, ratite birds, which are the big flightless birds that have flat breastbones, uh, like the kiwi and the ostrich and the rhea, and uh, these flowers in one family of flowering plants called the proteaceae. They're all found only on some or all of the continents that used to be Gondwana. And by the same token, we have things like bears and oak trees and uh, sequoias, um, plants like the, the giant sequoia and redwood in California, and of course the Chinese dawn redwood and bald cypress, um, and some fossils belonging to that group, which are found in Europe. Um, oaks and uh, dogwoods uh, like these, those are all found in Laurasia exclusively, with a couple of minor exceptions that we'll get to at the very end. They are also found that if you push the continents together, certain geological features would match up. Uh, the Appalachian Mountains of the eastern U.S. and their continuation northwards, the Adirondack Mountains, uh, end up uh, joining up with the Scottish Highlands, for example. And they're not just mountains and they don't just match up, they're made of about the same rock types and seem to have formed in about the same way. Uh, layers of glacial deposits and other rock types uh, fit back together if you take the continents and you shove them back together. Uh, like the cold measures of the eastern U.S. joining up with the coal beds of Europe, uh, or the desert sandstones and gypsum deposits of the western U.S. and Canada matching similar deposits in Siberia. And those match where you would expect them, to, those would be located in the places where you would expect them, uh, given uh, climate zones. Uh, Wegener pointed out that you could find evidence for past glaciations because when glaciers pass over a rock, they scratch it and the scratches are all in parallel. You know, like running your fingers over a blackboard, except it's glaciers. Sorry, but they both leave parallel scrapes is what I mean. Which means that you can tell you can find rock types that have been laid down or otherwise affected by glacial activity. And in fact, we can see them forming today. And if you find them in ancient rocks, you can quite literally map what direction the glaciers were moving by just measuring the compass direction of the glacial striations, uh, the scratches that glaciers leave on rocks. And when you put the continents together, it turns out that in Southern Gondwana, there's an entire zone where you find these glacial striations. And the glacial striations are all pointing in directions radiating away from where the South Pole used to be. So it all seemed to make sense. Vegana's ideas were widely dismissed at first, though, because it doesn't seem obvious that something as big as a bleeping continent can move. Like, as I've said, North America is about 3,000 miles wide and 25, feet th 25 miles thick and made of 
freaking granite, um, how is something like that going to move? Wegener himself didn't fully understand how they could move. He suggested it could have been the gravitational pull of the sun and moon, but somebody did the math and worked out that gravitational pull strong enough to move the continents around would be strong enough to stop the Earth from rotating. So the fact that the Earth is actually rotating um, suggests that that's not what does it. What does cause the continents to move was worked out between about 1950 and 1970 and worked out with the aid of much more sophisticated observations of the types of rocks that we actually do have on the floor of the deep ocean, which turns out to be a much more interesting place than anybody ever thought. Uh, Glomar Challenger, a uh, big drill ship, um, was really a top secret military project to try to recover a wrecked Soviet submarine and steal the code books. And it did in fact work. Um, we did it and it wasn't, the Soviets didn't know we'd done it. And the research wasn't declassified until many years later. But when the Glomar Challenger was uh, not chasing Soviet subs, uh, it and ships like it led to the formation of a modern body of theory called plate tectonics that was mostly together by about 1965. I have been told it was a tremendous time to be a geologist. People were arguing over all sorts of things. Data was flowing in. The textbooks couldn't get rewritten fast enough to keep up. It's cool to be in the middle of a major revolution in science. And here's what they found. The true edge of a continent is not where it meets the ocean, because that changes. Sea level rises and falls for reasons I may not have time to get into. Continents themselves can rise and sink. And there are places where you can see this very clearly. In um, parts of Los Angeles, for example, uh, you can be driving down the street and the road is sloping down to the ocean and then it stops at kind of a, a shallow, not quite a cliff, but you get this little platform and then the road drops down again and eventually comes to a bottoms out and comes to another little um, almost flat spot and then it drops down again to the beach. Uh, what you're going over is ancient coastlines times when the sea level was higher and the waves carved a beach and then the sea level dropped and the old beach was left high and dry and the waves started eroding a new coastline. So coastlines shift all the time. Uh, there are parts of the world where it's happening fast enough to observe. Um, in uh, parts of Scandinavia, if memory serves, there are parts of the coastline that are rising by something on the order of um, a third of a meter every hundred years, which is not enough to see from day to day, but it's certainly enough that over the course of a lifetime, you might notice that your boat dock is quite a bit farther out of the water than it was when you built it. Uh, in fact, it's the reason why a number of uh, Viking ports that have been excavated are now a couple of miles inland and completely high and dry. Yeah, Ragnar might not recognize Katagat if he were to come back, um, which he's not going to do because he's mostly a legendary character anyway, but I digress. The real edge of a continent looks like this. This happens to be a bit of the California coast. Uh, at the upper left, you can just see the south end of San Francisco Bay. Uh, the city of San Jose would be at the upper left. Or if you're from there, San Jose, it's one word. Um, and then kind of in the top middle, uh, that's Monterey Bay, uh, with the city of Monterey in it. Um, and in that coastal area up at the top middle, uh, the climate's cool year round, but not cold because you have a lot of sea fogs coming in. Uh, so they grow an awful lot of your vegetables there. It's a great place for growing celery. 
uh, year round. Garlic, they're crazy about garlic out there. Um, a lot of vegetables because the climate's good for year round production. Anyhow, the coastline is marked in that fine uh, black line. And if you were to wade into the water and start swimming out, you'd find that the water was relatively shallow. And by relatively shallow, I mean a few hundred feet. As long as you swim out, to, until you swim out to the edge of what's called the continental shelf. So the shelf is relatively flat. It's relatively shallow, as in typically a few hundred feet. And then the shelf starts dropping off at what we call the continental slope. And the continental slope is not quite that steep. This has been exaggerated a little bit. Uh, the continental slope might slope down by about one to two percent, like one foot in every hundred feet. You know, every hundred feet you walk, you descend a foot in altitude, which is noticeable, but not nearly as steep as that. You could drive down the continental slope in a truck if the water wasn't there and you were really careful and didn't get caught up in avalanches. Anyway, that slopes down to uh, the abyssal plain, which may be many thousands of feet down. I'm not sure about California, but in the middle of the Pacific, the real bottom of the ocean might be 20,000 feet um, down. Uh, so that can be pretty deep. And the edge of the shelf is the true edge of a continent. Uh, sea level can rise and fall, and so parts of the shelf might be flooded for a while and then exposed, um, and then flooded again and then exposed. Uh, there was a shelf area, for example, that used to connect Great Britain to mainland Europe, and it seems to have been a very nice hunting ground. Uh, we now call it Doggerland, and it got flooded, something on the roughly uh, about 8,000 BC, so about 10,000 years ago, and fishing ships now sometimes bring up uh, animal bones and stone tools and things like that. So we know people live there. Uh, and it's on the continental shelf, but at the moment it happens to be flooded. So sometimes the ocean might expose parts of the shelf. Sometimes it floods the shelf. What stays more or less fixed is the edge of the continental shelf. And that's the true edge of a continent, no matter what the ocean is doing. And for one thing, if you match up the outlines of the continental shelves, um, if you just go by the coastlines, then yeah, it sort of looks like they fit, but you know, maybe not. If you match up the outlines of the continental shelves, the fit is almost perfect. Uh, they've done computer simulations. There is virtually no way that you get a fit like that purely by chance. So there, we might notice that it uh, looks like Rio de Janeiro used to be right next door to um, either Angola, possibly Cameroon. I can't really tell without the country boundaries, but, um, oh yeah, look up uh, close to where it says New York, right? Um, just north of that, of course, is the city of Boston. Just outside of Boston, there's a town called Plymouth, and I have been there, and there's still a big rock at Plymouth, which supposedly, um, although probably not, but the story goes that that's the rock that the pilgrims set foot on when they came off the Mayflower and stepped out onto the New World, and uh, Danbeer died and were rescued by friendly natives uh, who, in a couple of decades they would end up massacring because, you know, whatever. Uh, but anyway, there's a big boulder called Plymouth Rock that supposedly marks the spot where the pilgrims uh, set foot. Plymouth Rock turns out to be a type of granite, and the body of granite actually crosses that plate boundary and extends into Africa. Uh, Plymouth Rock used to be a part of the African continent. Plymouth Rock is African-American. 
So there. Okay, just don't tell the uh, local school boards of the thing I'm teaching critical race theory or something like that. Anyway, so the continents of the earth and also the solid floor of the ocean make up what's called the crust of the earth. We've never successfully drilled out of the crust. There, there was a movie called The Core that, that presented a scenario in which we drilled down all the way to the core of the earth. And scientifically, it's one of the dumbest movies ever made. I know geology departments that show it just for common value. Um, but we're able to work out what's underneath the crust, not really by direct observation, but by things like carefully tracking the course of seismic waves, uh, the shock waves given off by earthquakes. Uh, we can actually measure very precisely their travel times, uh, the ways that they can be reflected or bent, uh, diffracted. And we can build up a picture in a way that's a little bit like building up a picture of a baby in a uterus, right? You can't see one directly, uh, but you can use sound waves. You can use ultrasound uh, to get pictures of what that baby looks like. And it's not a perfect analogy, but we can do something similar with seismic waves to build up a picture of what the Earth looks like in cross-section. And so we know that the crust is literally floating on top of a layer that is more dense. Um, the rocks that make up the crust are literally lighter, less dense than the rocks underneath, and they're floating on top. And this layer is solid, but it is under so much pressure and under such heat that over long periods of time, it gets gooey it doesn't really behave like it's solid rock, except it doesn't behave like <coughs> what you're used to thinking of solid rock is doing uh, because it's under such high temperature and high pressure uh, that it's actually plastic. Uh, it can flow over long periods of time. Uh, you can think of it as being something like peanut butter, I suppose. If, you heat, if, if your peanut butter was heated to thousands of degrees, that layer is called the mantle. And the upper layer of the mantle is called the asthenosphere. Uh, asthenos happens to be Greek for weak, W-E-A-K, weak in the sense of not strong. And both the continental crust that makes up the continents and the oceanic crust that make up the floor of the oceans are floating on that asthenosphere, on that upper mantle, and they're being carried around uh, as if they were on a conveyor belt. Uh, because even though that mantle rock is solid, if we could bring up a piece of it, it would be very hard and solid. Under extreme conditions of heat and pressure and over long time scales, it flows. And there's been some argument over what's causing that flow in the asthenosphere. Um, the simple answer is it's probably got something to do with convection. A better answer would be go get a degree in geophysics. But for our purposes, we can pretend it's probably convection in the asthenosphere. And it's not just that the continents are moving. That's why we no longer use the phrase continental drift. Uh, the Earth's crust is divided into tectonic plates that may contain mostly continental, mostly oceanic, or both types of crust. So the North American plate, for example, consists of all of North America, plus Greenland, uh, plus a good chunk of the floor of the Atlantic Ocean and the floor of the Gulf of Mexico. And it even includes part of Siberia. Um, and um, most, much of the floor of the Arctic Ocean is actually all part of the North American plate. Uh, the South American plate includes the South American mainland, 
but it also includes a good chunk of the floor of the South Atlantic Ocean. Uh, there are some plates like the Pacific Plate um, that are entirely oceanic crust, except for a couple of little islands, like the uh, Hawaii's in there. And as those little arrows show, the plates don't stand still. Plates can move away from each other, or they can move towards each other, or they can slide past each other. I mean, your fourth option is that sometimes the plates just kind of sit there. If you look at the boundary between the North America and the Eurasian plate way over in Siberia, um, that's not very well studied because it's pretty hard to get to, but there may not be an awful lot that's going on right there. Uh, so you can have quiet plate boundaries, but most of these plate boundaries are either pulling apart or they're coming together or they are um, doing the cha-cha slide. Sorry, that would explain um, the coast of California is sliding north compared to the North American plate, which means if it's doing the cha-cha slide, then yeah, I guess California has to slide to the left, slide to the right, and then the earthquakes are when the guy says, one hop this time. Two hops this time. Have you, do, have you, please tell me you've heard of this. Yes. You don't have to think it's funny, but am I at least landing a cultural reference here? Yes. Oh, okay. Right. This matters in a practical sense because plate margins are very often associated with earthquakes and volcanoes. Obviously, not all of them. Uh, Hawaii, for reasons we'll get into later, has earthquakes and very big volcanoes, and yet it's not on a plate margin, and I'll explain why that is in just a bit. Um, but you can see there is very heavy uh, earthquake activity uh, up the uh, Pacific coast of South America, up the Pacific coast of Central America, uh, California, of course, a lot up in uh, Alaska, especially around the Aleutian Islands, uh, and then coming around through Kamchatka, uh, Japan, um, Indonesia, um, all the way down to New Zealand. Uh, that whole rim of the Pacific Ocean is sometimes called the Ring of Fire uh, because it's got lots of earthquake activity and going with that, lots of volcanoes, in some, including some of the most destructive ones. Uh, Mount St. Helens, the last major eruption in the 48 states, is on that ring of fire. That's on a plate margin. Uh, so was Krakatau in 1883. Uh, the largest, okay, not the largest, but the largest well-documented volcanic eruption. Uh, the one that vaporized most of an island, uh, killed 35,000 people, sent shockwaves uh, all the way around the world twice, and uh, was heard 3,000 miles away. That's still a record for the loudest natural sound ever recorded. Uh, that was on that ring of fire as well. And even in places that are not so fiery, you can see that there's a lot of earthquake activity, those red dots, closely associated with plate boundaries, which are drawn here in yellow. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the punchline early. We now have technology that can track uh, plate movements. Uh, GPS, you know, the GPS in your phone can track where you are pretty precisely, but GPS with, um, more expensive receivers, you can quite literally measure your position on the surface of the earth down to the centimeter or less, down to the millimeter okay, uh, with the right receiving equipment. And it's been possible since the 80s to use GPS uh, technology to directly measure how fast the plates are moving. And it turns out to be, depending on where you are, 
plates are moving at speeds of between two and 15 centimeters per year. Uh, that's roughly somewhere between the speed of your fingernails growing uh, and the speed of your hair growing. And this is pretty much in line with estimates from the geological record of how fast they've moved over the past million years. Uh, if the Atlantic Ocean is, I forget, but let's say it's 3,000 miles wide and it opened up 150 million years ago, uh, you can do the math and get a rate of spreading of the Atlantic Ocean that's pretty close to what we observe now uh, from direct GPS measurements. So we have confirmed that Wegener was basically right and the continents are moving and they have been for millions of years. The mechanism turns out to be a little odd, although it ends up making a great deal of sense once you've got it down. There are zones in the ocean that we call mid-oceanic ridges. They're almost all in the ocean and inaccessible to, to observe unless you've got uh, submersibles that are designed to go down that deep. Uh, there aren't many places where you can see these on land. Uh, one of them, by the way, is Iceland. Uh, you can go to a valley outside the capital city of Reykjavik called Fingvelir, and you can quite literally stand with one foot on the North American plate and one foot on the Eurasian plate, if you're so minded. So that's one of the few places you can observe one of these mid-oceanic ridges on land. Most of the time you have to go deep down uh, in a submersible to see one. Mid-oceanic ridges are where new oceanic crust is constantly being produced. The continents aren't plowing through the crust. What's happening is that new crust is being made and old crust is being recycled. And it's made at these mid-oceanic ridges and along the ridges, molten rock from below pushes its way upward, pushes into the gap between plates and then solidifies to form new crust. And then that new rock is pushed aside by yet more molten rock that's pushing its way up, solidifying and forming new crust. So new crust is always forming at the mid-oceanic ridge and it's constantly, as it forms, it gets shouldered aside by newer molten rock that keeps pushing its way up. So older crust gets forced to go to the left and the right. New crust is being made right at the ridge. Uh, we can date uh, rock samples that we've brought up. And when you look at the ages of these rocks, they look like this. Uh, the youngest rocks in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean are the ones that are forming now along the mid-oceanic ridge. And with submersibles and remote probes, it's been possible to see this happening. Um, so the youngest ocean floor is the stuff that's forming today along that ridge, which you know, go, runs from Iceland all the way down to uh, the Antarctic, you know, like the seam on a baseball. The farther you go from that mid-oceanic ridge in either direction, uh, the older the rock is. Uh, the oldest rocks in the Atlantic are the ones that are right next to the continental shelves of North America and Africa. And uh, that's the ones that are shown in blue. And uh, those rocks, I think, are about 150 million years old. Uh, the oldest oceanic crust anywhere is only about 210 million years old. Now, lots of continental rocks are much older than that. Uh, the bedrock that you're standing on, or at least this building is standing on, uh, the bedrock that you can see uh, in road cuts around here, like you know where they had to blast through a hill to get the road to, to uh, push through, 
Uh, the rocks around here were roughly 300 million years old. Uh, they're 90 million years older than the oldest rock making up the floor of the deep ocean. Uh, they're the oldest rocks exposed on the surface in Arkansas would be roughly uh, 450 million. Uh, the oldest rocks that I've ever personally wandered around on out in Nevada uh, would be about 1.4 billion. Uh, there's lots of much older rock on the continents. Oceanic crust doesn't live to be nearly that old because new oceanic crust is constantly being created. And as we'll see, old oceanic crust is constantly being destroyed. So the reason why North America and Europe are moving apart and South America and Africa are moving apart is that new crust constantly forms along that mid-oceanic ridge and it constantly pushes older rocks to the left and right. But if new crust is being formed, either the earth is blowing up like a balloon, which it isn't, or crust must also be destroyed. And the places where old oceanic crust gets recycled are zones where one plate sinks under another and old crust gets shoved down into the mantle and given enough time, eventually will completely reincorporate back into the mantle. Uh, although this can take a very long time. Where that takes place is called a subduction zone. Now, a uh, completely gratuitous joke. The technical name for mountain building in geology is orogeny, O-R-O-G-E-N-Y. And at areas where one plate is sinking under another, one of the things you can get is the formation of mountain ranges, uh, which is why you used to be able to get t-shirts at uh, international geology meetings uh, with um, uh, slogans like uh, subduction stimulates orogenous zones, which sounds really spicy, but in fact just means that in places where one plate is sinking under the other, you get mountain building. It's, it's one of those things that sounds a lot spicier than it really is and is, you know, supposed to freak, freak out the, uh, the non-geologists in the supermarkets or, or whatever. Anyway. Uh, the, the biggest company that used to make t-shirts like that uh, used to be in Eureka Springs. They may still be there. Anyway, so in a subduction zone, that's where one plate sinks under another, and the one that sinks down goes down in the mantle and eventually, after millions of years, gets incorporated back into the mantle rocks um, and you know, just gets blended in with the rest of the mantle. And where you've got a subduction zone, you'll typically see a trench and then a, I should actually call it a volcanic arc because it doesn't always form islands, but you'll get a chain of volcanoes running parallel to the trench. Hawaii is not one of these, but the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska are one. Uh, the Philippines and Japan are right next to subduction zones. Uh, so is most of the country of Indonesia, which is one of the most volcano prone uh, areas in the world. Hawaii is not a subduction zone, it's something else. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So here's what this looks like, if you could see this in cross section. Um, there's a piece of oceanic crust that's sinking down as it moves from left to right, uh, where it says subduction complex, um, the old sediments that used to be on top of the sinking plate may get scraped off the sinking plate and stuck onto the edge of the plate that's riding above. Uh, an awful lot of the bedrock of the city of San Francisco is ancient deep sea sediments that used to be sitting on top of a plate that is now almost completely disappeared uh, called the Farallon Plate 
uh, that subducted under the North American plate a very long time ago. And I know this because one of my lab mates back in my grad school days uh, was actually working on finding fossils from these rocks, uh, which was not easy because they've been very badly distorted and mushed up. But anyway, yeah, North America has actually grown a bit uh, from sediments that have gotten scraped off of ancient plates and stuck on. Anyway, as that oceanic plate sinks down, um, once it reaches a certain depth in the asthenosphere, uh, it begins to melt. Um, partly because that oceanic crust rock is saturated with water and water lowers the melting point of rocks. Uh, wet rock melts uh, at a lower temperature than dry rock does. I could not tell you the physics behind it. It's just one of those things. Anyway, that creates this huge blob of melting rock and it begins to rise and eventually it will punch its way through the crust and form volcanoes. And in particular, remember you're seeing this in cross section, uh, that trench right there that's labeled might extend for thousands of miles and you'll get a chain of volcanoes parallel to the trench. That's what a subduction zone looks like. We can actually see what this looks like. You know, the, the way we know how to draw diagrams like the one you just saw is that seismic waves travel faster in cold rock than in hot rock, which means that if you've got seismographs recording uh, earthquake waves, and very, very good timekeeping abilities. You can calculate the travel time of earthquake waves uh, from their origin, from an area called the focus, uh, to where your seismographs are. You can record the travel time and use fluctuations in the, or variation in the travel time to get this cross-sectional picture of what parts of the crust are a bit cooler and a bit warmer than other parts of the crust. And this is literally a cross section of a zone in the Southern Pacific. Uh, that blue area is the Pacific plate. And you can see there's this zone of slightly cooler rock that's getting pushed down into the hotter asthenosphere, which is green. And it goes down all the way to almost 700 kilometers before it finally warms up enough that it gets incorporated back into the asthenosphere, back into the mantle. So you are literally seeing the edge of a, of a plate right there getting pushed down into the asthenosphere. Uh, and as it gets pushed down, by the way, as it begins to melt, it forms blobs of lava of magma, of liquid rock that push their way up and create things like the Tonga uh, Island Arc in the middle of the ocean. Another beautiful one, this is the uh, Aleutian Islands. Up at the top right, that is Alaska itself. Uh, the city of Anchorage is pretty close to the top right corner. Um, over on the left, that is part of Siberia, uh, in particular, a part of it called the Kamchatka Peninsula. Uh, the Aleutian Islands and uh, the Katmai Peninsula of Alaska um, bridge between continents, and uh, they actually do form, you can see why it's called an island arc. Uh, on a flat map, it looks like an arc. Um, it's an arc because the earth is curved. Uh, it looks like an arc for the same reason that if you take an orange and you slice into it at a low angle, you'll make a cut that is an arc. Right? It's an arc as a consequence of the fact that the earth is round. There, I said it. The earth is round and it, it spins and it goes around the sun. And I don't care who knows it. Suck it flat earthers. Anyway, um, so you can see it is an island arc. 
It's there because the Pacific plate is moving to the northwest. And right along the Aleutian Trench is where the Pacific plate is sinking under the North American plate. So the plate is moving to the northwest. The trench marks the spot where the Pacific plate is being driven down into the asthenosphere. And where it melts, it creates this chain of volcanoes. Um, some of those volcanoes make up the Aleutian Islands, uh, which are still volcanically active. Um, I don't know of any recent big eruptions, but there are pretty much constant rumblings and smokings among the Aleutian Islands. Uh, by the way, if you don't know where the Aleutian Islands are, if you've ever watched the show, The Deadliest Catch, uh, that centers on the fishing fleet based out of a harbor called Dutch Harbor, uh, which is more or less in the middle of the Aleutians. Um, Others of those volcanoes uh, make up uh, something that's glommed on to mainland Alaska. That's the Katmai Peninsula, uh, which was the site of, I think, the largest volcanic eruption recorded in the United States uh, back in 1912, uh, creating a uh, massive crater zone uh, that to this day is known as the Valley of 10,000 Spokes. Very volcanically active there. And that is as beautiful an island arc as ever you'll see. Oh, incidentally, arcs don't necessarily form islands. There's a very small place off the Pacific coast of North America that is sinking down. It's called the Juan de Fuca plate. And that has created a deep sea trench. And it's also created a chain of volcanoes, but they don't form islands because they're coming up on the North American mainland. Uh, everything from Lassen Peak and Mount Shasta in Northern California, all the way up to Mount Garibaldi in British Columbia, uh, there's a whole chain of potentially active volcanoes there called the Cascade Range. Uh, Mount St. Helens, uh, went off big time in 1980. Uh, I remember seeing the footage, I was 10. Uh, that was the last major volcanic eruption in the 48 states uh, outside of Alaska or Hawaii. And it killed 47 people and devastated thousands of miles, square miles of forest. It only killed, I think, 47 people because it, uh, Mount St. Helens was in a pretty unpopulated area. Uh, but the Cascades also include Mount Hood, uh, which is pretty close to Portland, Oregon, and Mount Rainier, um, which is right next door to the greater, greater Seattle metro area. And Mount Rainier last erupted in, I think, 1735, but it's not extinct. It could still go off. If it goes off, Seattle is screwed. Uh, not, not so much from lava as from the fact that when a volcano that's covered in snow erupts, the snow immediately melts into water, mixes with volcanic ash, and you get this giant volcanic mudslide um, steamrollering down the side of the volcano. Uh, imagine a suburb getting hit by a river of cement uh, 20 feet deep and going 60 miles an hour. Um, yeah, that is what's likely to happen to Tacoma uh, if Rainier ever goes off in a big way. This is the kind of thing that gives urban planners nightmares. And it will happen one day. Hopefully we get warning. Maybe not. Then life will rapidly turn into a Jerry Bruckheimer movie. Anyway, so Mid-oceanic ridges are sometimes called divergent plate boundaries because that's where plates are pulling apart. Trenches are the island arcs are sometimes called convergent plate boundaries because that's where the plates are coming together. Um, oh, incidentally, you can also have convergent plate boundaries if you have two continents hitting each other. 
Uh, the classic example right there is the Himalayas, which is where India, which is a little microcontinent of its own, has crashed into Asia, uh, crumpling both countries like uh, the crumpled fenders of two cars uh, sustaining a head-on collision. Um, for that matter, um, before Pangaea existed, there were other continents and other places, and when they came together to form Pangaea, uh, they threw up big mountain ranges that used to be the size of the Himalayas today. Uh, we now know them, for example, as the Appalachians and the Washita's. Yeah, the Washita Mountains may once have been as tall as Mount Everest. Uh, they've kind of worn down a bit in the intervening uh, 270 million years. Right. So plates can come together or they can pull apart. Your third option is that they can slide. Uh, what we call transform faults or transform plate boundaries are what you get when plates move sideways with respect to each other. Most of these are also deep under the ocean. Uh, there's lots of transform uh, faults or transform boundaries, but most of them cannot be seen on land. Uh, one of the few that can uh, looks like this from the air. Uh, this is the San Andreas Fault in Central California. And yeah, you can drive across it. You can walk right up to it. Uh, you can stick sensitive measuring instruments on it, which a lot of uh, institutions are doing. Um, you can study a, a fault right there. By the way, where a fault cuts across land, it will often create some sort of valley or cliff called a fault spar. And these are, um, these are actually not that hard to find. I think I mentioned this once, but I'll give you a different story. I was poking around once in southeastern California, uh, close to the town of Independence on Highway 395. And it's out in the desert. This is not glamorous LA or San Francisco or anything like that. This is, this is way out in the desert. There's actually a range of hills out there called the Alabama Hills. They're named after Alabama because of Civil War stuff. Don't worry about it. But you've probably seen the Alabama Hills because the Alabama Hills have been scenery in almost 200 classic Western movies and six different serials. And they're used today in things like car commercials. You know, if you've ever seen a, a car being advertised as just driving through picturesque, you know, hilly desert scenery, it was probably the Alabama Hills. Uh, because the Alabama Hills are within driving distance of Los Angeles. Anyway, I'm hiking around in the Alabama Hills, and you can find, as you're, you know, going down the flank of the Alabama Hills, it's a fairly easy slope, it's not a hard hike, and then all of a sudden the ground just kind of drops down about 10 feet. Uh, and you just come to this little cliff uh, that you have to clamber down. And uh, turns out that cliff is a fault scar because there's a fault cutting up the side of the Alabama hills. And that fault scar formed when land on one side of the fault got shoved up and or land on the other side dropped down. And we know this, by the way, because it happened in 1872. Uh, there were people present uh, I think it was June 10th, 1872, uh, there were people there. And, you know, there were people killed uh, because there were, there were towns that were devastated by this. And you've got records of when it happened. So anytime you've got a crack in the crust, a fault, where there are periodic earthquakes, it leaves a permanent scar. Um, that you can explore, that you can, in this case, you can see it right from the air. Uh, that's called a false spark. And here's the thing. One end of the San Andreas Fault is down in the Gulf of California at the lower right. Uh, 
the gulf between the mainland of Mexico and the Baja California Peninsula. Beautiful place to go exploring. Love it. Wish I could go back. Anyway, uh, so the San Andreas Fault connects some mid oceanic ridges in the Gulf of California with mid oceanic ridges in the North Pacific. People used to say California was going to fall into the ocean. Uh, well, it's not, but it is getting dragged northwards um, because relative to North America, the Pacific plate is moving to the Northwest. And the coast of California from San Francisco all the way down to Baja is slowly getting dragged Northwest. Uh, part of the reason why the San Andreas Fault is the site of so many dangerous earthquakes is the fact that it's not a smooth ride because the San Andreas Fault has that little bend in it just north of Los Angeles. You see how it makes a little, uh, a little bend. And you can't slide things past each other if there's a bend in the join between them. Um, and the result has been uh, Los Angeles has all these mountains just north of it that are formed by compression uh, because that's where the San Andreas Fault is jammed. Uh, so that's why Los Angeles has the San Gabriel Mountains and other mountain ranges to the north of it. Uh, they kind of cut it off from the rest of the world. You have to go over some mountain passes if you're driving to LA. You know, it's like it's on the world out there. So anyway, last thing before, no, I'll tell you what, it's 10 to 10. Uh, take a 15 minute break and we'll reconvene at 10 25. Uh, I'll get to hot spots and after I finish hot spots, I promise I will actually get back to some biology. So I'll stop the recording.